So what economists have done, instead of taking the actual change in quantity in reference to a price change, which is the slope of the function, um, what we've done is said instead, compare the percentage change in quantity uh, with the percentage change in price. Uh, and so it's a ratio. Elasticity is a ratio of the responsiveness of quantity, that's the numerator, divided by the percentage change in price. Numerator is the dependent variable. Change in price is the independent variable. So change in quantity is, re is in response to a change in price. The same thing's true for supply. Percentage change in quantity being produced in response to the percentage change uh, in price. So the simplest method of calculating a percentage change is simply to take the starting point, take the amount of the change, and then, you know, and then divide through to get a percent. If I said to you price went from a dollar to a dollar ten, what's the percentage increase? You see, you just know it automatically, right? It's ten percent. But the way you actually got that was to take the change in price, which is ten, divide by the dollar, which was the starting point, and that's how you got uh, the ten percent. Uh, uh, so, so that's the simple way uh, of doing it. The problem with point elasticity, though, is that if I take two points on a demand curve, such as, oh no, now it's doing this. Okay. If I take two points on the demand curve, which is A and B, which is 4 and 6 and 120 and 80, which you have in your notes in the printout. Um, but irrespective of that, you can just see what the problem is. If you measure from the, from the high point downward, then the high point is your base reference point, right? And if you measure from the bottom, B, upward, then the, the change in price is the same, but the, but the reference quantity is different because the end point is, is, uh, is different. So we calculate what is called arc elasticity, Good. Uh, so we calculate arc elasticity by using the midpoint be to the t between the two quantities and the midpoint between the two prices as our reference point. So you can see that the change in quantity is the same. We divide that, though, by the midpoint of the two quantities, Q1 plus Q2 over 2. The change in price is the same, but we divide it in reference to uh, P uh, the midpoint of the two prices, P1 plus P2 divided by 2. If you do that, then in either direction, you're going to get the same answer because you're using the midpoint in both cases uh, uh, to make the calculation. So anytime you are asked to calculate elasticity, always calculate arc elasticity. Uh, most likely, I will say arc elasticity, but that's, that's, the, that's the unbiased estimate of this, this particular measure of responsiveness to a change in price. So why do we care? Well, we care because depending upon how responsive buyers are, we get different effects on total revenue of changing price. If the numerator, that's quantity, is bigger than the denominator, that means that the number will be bigger than one, the absolute value will be bigger than one. And if demand is what we call elastic, which is, which is this range, then lowering price increases total revenue. Lowering price increases uh, total revenue. Uh, in fact, just think about it. When you hear the word elastic, forget what I've talked about, what does that mean to you? Stretchy, good. And if something's very elastic, stretches a lot, right? Same thing here. Very elastic means a big quantity of response to that, uh, to that change in price. If, in fact, there's an offset, meaning I raise price by 5%, but I lose 5% of my sales, then the number will be negative 1. It'll always be negative because demand's downward sloping. Uh, and in that case, it's a wash. Uh, uh, I, I, what, what did I just say? Lower price? 
I lower price by 10%, so I get 10% less money from the buyers, but I get 10% more buyers. So the additional units sold is the same as the amount of lost uh, revenue uh, from the units I was previously selling at the higher price. That's called unitary elastic elasticity. Unit means one, so unitary would be, uh, would be that point. If instead the buyers don't respond very much to your price change, uh, and that is the numerator is smaller than the denominator, that means that the, the number will be a fraction. Uh, it will be less than one. Uh, because the numerator is smaller than the denominator. And if it's the case that demand is inelastic, excuse me, raising price would raise total revenue. You can see that from these uh, examples. If demand's elastic, lowering price greatly, well, increases total revenue. If demand is inelastic, then in fact raising price because I don't lose very many units sold, increasing price uh, raises uh, total revenue. So if you look at a straight line demand curve, the upper half is the elastic region. The upper half of the curve is the elastic region. The midpoint of the curve is unitary elastic, and the lower half is inelastic. Uh, and just visualize uh, uh, prices, like my standard example, 10, 9, 8, etc. Lower my price from 10 to 9, I sell two shirts, total revenue went up to 18 from $10. If demand's inelastic, that's the bottom area, and I was charging uh, uh, 9, I was selling uh, two shirts, getting 18. If I raise the price to 4, uh, 4 sixes are 24. So you, everybody see it? If demand is the lower half, then it's inelastic. The upper half is elastic. For that reason, when you draw the demand curve, if you simply draw a flat curve, that is the upper half of that straight line demand curve. Just visualize taking it out. Here's the curve. If I extended it all the way out till it, we, till it meets the axis, then this is clearly the upper half of the curve. And so you'll get the right result if you want to analyze what happens when demand is elastic, you'll get the right result uh, in this case. Clearly, the, the inelastic is, is, is steeper than 45 degrees. Uh, just draw a steep curve because, again, you can see if you, extended, if you extended this line all the way up to where it meets the axis, then you're clearly on the lower half of the curve. So for purposes of, of drawing graphs and solving problems, if you draw it flat, you'll get the right geometry with, uh, for elastic, and, and if you draw it steeper than 45, you'll get the right effect on inelastic. Incidentally, yeah. Incidentally, we're, we're talking about the effect on total revenue, on total revenue. So if demand's elastic, they respond a lot to the price change. Uh, and if I lower price, I sell a lot more units, right? The quantity's bigger than the price change. But I don't know the effect on profit because as I sell more units, I have to produce more units. Everybody see it, right? Profit is total revenue minus total cost. If I produce more, uh, if demand's elastic and I produce more, Total revenue goes up, but total cost also goes up. So I'm not sure about the effect on profit. However, if demand is inelastic, if demand's inelastic, how do you get more money? Raise price or lower it? Raise price, right? Good, because they don't respond very much. And in that case, total revenue goes up and total cost goes down because I'm producing fewer units than I did before. Excellent. So, so with respect to profit, you're unsure of the effect if it's elastic. But if it's inelastic, you know raising price will increase profitability, right? So, so understanding that, a firm would never knowingly price in the inelastic portion of a demand curve. You all with me? If you, if, if you, if you estimate demand is inelastic, you're, you're going to raise price. You're going to raise price. Uh, so the firm would never knowingly, uh, uh, as I said, be operating in that uh, particular range. So now we can, we can see now what is the effect on price and quantity changes given different possible elasticities of, of uh, demand or supply. Here I have a relatively flat supply curve, so it's elastic and demand increases. 
notice that uh, price goes up. Oops, we're in. Price goes up by a little bit, but quantity goes up uh, by a lot. And, and the reason is, it doesn't take much of an increase in price for sellers to be willing to increase production. They're very responsive to uh, price changes. Uh, maybe they have some unused resources, or, or you can duplicate, almost duplicate, the means of production you were using at the lower uh, price. If supply is inelastic, then in fact the same change in demand would lead to a larger uh, increase in price, because the curve's steeper, and a smaller increase in, uh, in quantity. Uh, and, uh, and, and this might be the case where the firm is maybe operating close to capacity. Uh, and so consequently, uh, it, it, it takes a big increase in price for them to increase the rate of, uh, the rate of production. You can do the same thing with comparing elastic demand or uh, 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 with, it, with changes in supply. If demand's elastic, again, you get a big quantity response, not much of a price response. Uh, uh, and then if they're both, and then if, if, if they're both inelastic, then in fact you're going to see a big price change and not much of a quantity uh, change. It turns out that, well, let me ask you, what would you guess is true about the elasticity of demand for gasoline as a product? For all, just gasoline anywhere, would that be highly elastic or inelastic? inelastic. Good, inelastic. And 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 you guys know this. When you go in, often you don't even look at the price, right? I mean, you might look at the dollar part of the price, but prices go from you know three twenty-five down to two ninety, and then they go up to three forty, and and so forth. You hardly change the amount you buy. In fact, you probably fill up the way I do, uh, unless it's close to the end of the month, and you know, and budgets are constraining. But um, so so demand for gasoline is very very inelastic, and. Um, and it turns out that supply is also very inelastic right now because, number one, we have not built a refinery in the United States in 30 years. We have not increased our refining capacity in 30 years in the United States. What used to be the case, if you look at the uh, supply of gasoline was, it used to be relatively elastic because when we went into the Middle East, and discovered that, well, in fact, I'll tell the story. When we went into the Middle East after World War II, the geologists had figured out that there's a lot of oil underneath all these countries. So the seven major oil companies in the United States divided up the market so they wouldn't have to compete with each other. So they actually did a lottery, and, uh, and Texaco got, uh, I think it was Algeria, um, and, and, I, and, and maybe Exxon got Saudi Arabia, but they went out to meet with the sheikhs who run these countries, and they said, we'd like to buy your oil. And the sheikh said, okay, but uh, um, we don't have any way of getting it from, we, we don't have a way, any way of pumping it because there's no electricity there. And the firm said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll put the electricity in. Well, there's, there's no roads to these areas where you want to drill. Oh, we'll put the roads in. Right, good. Okay, but we have no way of getting the oil from there to the port. Oh, we'll put pipelines in. Right. Uh, well, that's good, but the port is so small, the big tankers can't come in. Well, we'll build the port. Y'all with me? Good. And so the sheikh said, well... If you're willing to do that, yeah, let's let's enter into a contract. And so they agreed on a price and so forth. And uh, and then these firms put in millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, to build out the infrastructure in these countries uh, uh, to produce. And then after it had been done, Algeria said to Texaco, um, "We're nationalizing all of that. That now belongs to us. Everything belongs to us." And they said, no, 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 we had an agreement with, with the sheikh. We, that sheikh's not here anymore. I'm here, and now we'll talk about price, right? And so I love to tell the story because these guys are all from Texas, and they all, they all felt like they really, you know, uh, what is this guy's sheikh? Look at what he's wearing, right? And they thought they, would re they had really won, and then the sheikh said, now we'll talk about price. As I started to say, Saudi Arabia decided to put in twice the capacity of what Exxon was w wanted to buy. 
uh, they said, I want the pipeline twice as big and I want the, the drilling to be able to produce twice the volume. The reason was that they wanted the ability to expand production if demand went up or price went up, but they also had the ability then, by restricting output, uh, uh, to, in fact, uh, get the price up. And so OPEC was formed, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and Saudi Arabia was the leader in that. And... Uh, uh, and so that was the that was the the reason for doing it. But so I started to say initially because Saudi Arabia had this excess capacity, supply world supply was relatively elastic. What's happened over time is that demand's increased, and now Saudi Arabia is very close to capacity. So and 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 so are the other uh, the other locations. So the supply is relatively. Uh, and you already said that demand is very inelastic. So both of those curves, it, it takes a big price change to change the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied. If you look at gas prices at different stations, you know, Texaco and Exxon and Arco and all of them, they tend to move together. They tend to move together. And so, so some people would say, well, that's a sign of collusion. You know, all these companies, you know, talk to each other and they agree what the price is going to be. No, it's the result of the fact that all of them have estimated the elasticity of demand. So when there is a shortfall in production, such as when the hurricane struck Houston and, and Galveston in particular, which is the island where a lot of oil is drilled and produced, um, those, refi th those drilling sites had to shut down. And the oil companies all figured out what the, what the percentage reduction is likely to be in world production. You all with me? What the percentage production is. They didn't know how long it's going to last, but they could figure out the percentage. If I know that, then I can figure out the change in price, uh, uh, right? If I know elasticity, I know one of them. I, I, can, produce, I, can, I can calculate uh, the other. Uh, so that's that's actually what was taking place, wh was that they all know, you know, they all estimate what it's going to be, and then they all uh, adjust prices in that way. Yeah? Good, good, good. Thanks. Um, this, this is the seating chart. So each seat has a box. <laughs> and uh, what you want to do is fill in, number one, you're going to fill it in upside down from the way you're sitting, because I'm the one that wants to read it, right? So when it gets to you, simply put in your first name, whatever you go by, and, and your last name, and just print it uh, uh, in there. Also, be sure that you get the, like, like this is that wall, right? And this is that aisle. I had one class that, that just couldn't do it. <laughs> the third row just kept putting themselves on the opposite end. So when it gets to you, make sure that you... Uh, that you're in the right seat. So that's you first and last. Good. Thanks. Oh, and, and so, by the way, as I was pointing out, when both curves are relatively inelastic, small changes in percentage uh, of, of being supplied has a big effect on price. Uh, and that's why, uh, that's why you see this volatility in prices. Uh, there was a fire in a refinery in uh, Ohio about, I don't know when it was. There's a, there is a refinery down between, down in south, down by the airport off the 405. Um, but this one in, in, in Ohio was a large refinery that had been servicing a large number of places, a large geographic area. And after the fire, Prices went up by like a dollar and fifteen cents because the major source that was low cost was that refinery, and it had shut down in that uh, in that way. Good. So the next logical question is: Well, why would demand be very elastic for something or inelastic? What would be the factors that would influence how responsive buyers are to a change in price? And the first factor and the major factor is the number and closeness of substitute products. If there are lots of close substitutes, or maybe not a lot, but very similar products, then demand's going to be very elastic because buyers can switch really easily, right? If the products are almost identical, then, then, then uh, they can switch really easily. I mentioned 
No, I didn't mention. Alkaline batteries. Who are the major producers? Duracell and Energizer, right? They have like 90% of the market. It's called a duopoly. These two firms have, have almost 90% of the market. Uh, and so there's not a lot of substitutes. If you buy something, if you buy like a toy, you may have Korean batteries in it when you first buy it. And Kirkland makes batteries. But, but as I said, these two companies make up like 90% of the sales. But even though there's only two companies, demand is highly uh, elastic because they're so similar, right? They're, they're just almost, almost the same. Good. And then if there are lots of substitutes, the same thing, like, like pizza. There's like, I don't know, like nine or ten companies, right, that all sell pizza, and, and they're very, very similar uh, uh, in that way. Good. The second factor is how much information does the buyer have about the change in price and about the availability of the substitute products. The more you know about the price change and, and the more you know about where are the alternatives, the more elastic demand would tend to be. You know, you buy stuff like I do, and sometimes you don't even look at the price, right? You just go into 7-Eleven, pick up the chips and the beer and whatever, and just, you know, buy it and go on out. So initially, people may not notice price changes, but clearly as time goes on, people begin to see, wow, you know, there really has been a change in price. Good. So more information would be a bigger response, and obviously you have to know about the substitutes in order to change and buy from them. So... Uh, uh, so the more knowledge you have about both or either, uh, uh, the more responsive or more elastic demand will tend to be. Third is the percentage of your income or your budget that you're spending on this particular, uh, this particular good. The, the larger the percent of your, of your income or budget, the more elastic demand tends to be. And just think about it. The reason is if it's a bigger part of your budget, then you're going to find out about substitutes, right? You're going to find out about it. You know, chewing gum goes from a dollar to a dollar and a quarter. Well, you don't even notice it, right? You just buy stuff from 7-Eleven. Well, that's a 25% price increase. If your tuition went up by 25%, what would happen to the quantity demanded? It would go down a lot more, right? Good. My son uh, designs websites and does commercial art for companies and does logo design and all these kinds of things. And we were talking about, about his business, and, and I said, how much do you charge for changing a page on the website? And he said, $50. And, and, uh, but, but he has customers, like the Johnsons have a, a tropical fish store in Santa Barbara. And they have a different fish of the month. So every month they change the page and put a new picture up. But he also sell, He also has, a, has Verizon as a client. And Verizon changes the coverage maps as they become different. So I said to him, here's what you want to do. And you guys will recognize this from Amazon's pricing, right, on delivery. What you do is you say standard is $50.00. Uh, five to seven business days, right? Express is overnight, uh, two days, and that is one hundred. That that is, yeah, a hundred dollars. And then if you want it done over, if you want it done the same day or the, or overnight, that's two hundred dollars. Good. Well, the Johnsons are the elastic demanders, right? Because you know this big part of their advertising budget. Well, they can easily give you the picture for seven days ahead of time, right? Good. When does Verizon want that page changed? Immediately, good, because they're coverage maps and usually they're expanding and so forth. Plus, as a percentage of their budget, you know, the, the cost of changing the spend, their budget's in the millions of dollars, right? So as a percentage of, of their budget, it's a tiny amount and consequently demands very inelastic. Uh, and so he's, he's done that and, and, increased, uh, uh, and, and increased profitability. I had a good friend, a young lady in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I grew up, and uh, her father owned the uh, mortuary. And as you all may know, mortuaries are licensed by the state, and so they're limited in number. And so it's like a monopoly, right? It means there's a lot of market power because there's not that much competition. So it, it, they do very, very well. And she decided she wanted to open a boutique store, uh, and so her father 
built out this space and, and got the store up and running. And uh, it's in a shopping center. And, uh, uh, and, and Macy's is across, is, is at the other side of the shopping center. It's an outdoor shopping center and so forth. So I visited her Christmas four or five years ago and, and went down. The store is just beautiful, just beautiful inside. And all the, pe all the women are beautiful and they're intelligent, right? They know all the products. They know how to cook. They do cooking demonstrations, right? She has really high-end flatware and placemats and, and then standard also, et cetera. So I said, how do you decide on your pricing? And she said, I use Keystone pricing. Keystone pricing is 100% markup over cost. Y'all with me? Just called Keystone. It's very standard in retail. It's kind of a rule of thumb, right? And that's about what I would do. And uh, she had this gigantic globe, this gigantic globe. It was like three feet in diameter. And then when you opened up, it was a bar inside, right? And it had places for the bottles and the, and the glasses and, the, and, and, and so forth. And I said, uh, and this was this was before Christmas. Uh, and I said, um, uh, "What are you charging for it?" And she said, "Three hundred." And uh, uh, and I said, "And what happened when you put it on sale?" And she said, "I sold out in two days." She only had five of them, right? She just sold out immediately. I said, "For something like this, you you should start out at like nine hundred dollars because there's no close substitutes." Y'all with me? There's nothing real similar to that around so it's really unique and then I said on your flatware where or on your placemats where Macy's carries the same one I would price 10 percent above Macy's price 10 percent above because your store is more fun to go into than uh, than Macy's uh, uh, and we talked about a lot of other things uh, uh, in a similar manner so she changed her pricing and I saw her the next Christmas and she was really excited because she made a lot more money right she didn't give me any of it, but uh, <laughs> but we did well. Good. And then finally, the amount of time following the price change will have an effect on elasticity. And it's such a strong relationship that it's actually called the second law of demand. And that is, over time, people adjust more to a change in price. People adjust more over time. Demand is more elastic over a longer uh, period of time. There are only three laws in economics. First law of demand, downward sloping. Second law, more elastic. And third is a law about production. Why is that the case? Well, because over time, people get more information about the price change uh, and about available substitutes. Um, years ago, beef and pork were, were major, beef was the major source of meat. Chicken was sold but it was usually fried. People would fry it, right? There weren't a lot of oh, there weren't a lot of recipes for it. Had a drought. Beef went way up in price, uh, and so and 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 so chicken is a substitute for it, and so people started turning towards chicken. But over time, all these magazines like House and Garden and all these magazines came out with new recipes on how to cook chicken. Y'all with me, right? And as that happened a larger quantity switch took place because now people knew more alternatives about how to prepare uh, that food. Secondly, there are more, there tend to be more substitutes over time uh, and, and hybrids is a great example of this. The price of gasoline went way up in 1979 because OPEC had greatly restricted uh, output and in fact there were shortages in the United States uh, uh, because there were price controls uh, on the gas stations. Um, and so people began in, began to increase their interest in alternative forms of transportation, such as electricity, right, and eventually hydrogen. Uh, and so over time, more of these substitutes came out. And so consequently, you'd see more of a switch away from the cars that use a lot uh, of gasoline. And finally, and this is important, over time, you have more time to adjust all the, all the other goods that you buy that, that are complements to this particular good. Uh, 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 you know, you have an SUV, and, and, and it was a three-year lease, and you still have a year left on the lease, and all of a sudden gas prices go to $5 a gallon. Well, you're going to cut back how much you drive, right? Some. 
but you're probably not going to cancel the lease because there's a big penalty for canceling that. But after that year, when you now look at vehicles, you'll look at what? Miles per gallon, right? Good. And so once you've been able to change that complement, which is the automobile in this case, then you, you see a bigger reduction in the amount of gasoline uh, being purchased. Um, uh, if gas prices are higher, when you move to a new area uh, for a job, you're likely to locate closer to the job than you are now. Uh, you know, it's unbelievable. There are people out in Thousand Oaks who drive downtown every day, every day, and, and it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's like three hours a day at least in their cars and stuff, right? Good, thanks. Um, uh, uh, so, so my point is over time, people adjust more to price changes, more substitutes available, more information, and uh, ability to change these complementary goods. Good. Now, there are other elasticities besides the elasticity of price elasticity of demand. Uh, uh, you can measure the percentage change in quantity sold in response to any other variable, right? Any other, any other variable. And it will always be the same. Quantity in the, in the numerator, independent variable in the denominator. So I could calculate, for example, the income elasticity of demand, the income elasticity <coughs> of demand. Our seller, our buyers, does changes in income have a big effect on the amount that they're buying uh, from me? And again, again, see, quantity is always in the numerator, and here, percentage change in income in the uh, denominator. For most goods, which we'll call normal goods, it's a positive relationship. In fact, we, I did, I did, I did normal and inferior goods before when we talked about uh, the effects. Good. So for normal goods, it's a positive relationship. Income goes up, quantity demanded uh, goes up. Just a couple examples of that for uh, some actual estimates. Clothing uh, uh, is about a 10%, uh, close to unitary uh, elastic. Uh, uh, and 10% um, increase would lead to almost a 10% increase in quantity sold. Stereo units uh, have, a, have a high income elasticity of demand, and that is a 10% increase in income leads to almost a 30% increase in purchase. It doesn't have to be quantity. It doesn't mean you're going to buy three times as many stereo sets. So the adjustment could be in uh, quantity or in quality. You just buy uh, nicer things. Inferior goods, in inverse relationship. <laughs> Income goes up. People buy uh, less of them. What would you guess is true about Starbucks coffee? Did I talk about this before? Would Starbucks be a normal good or inferior? Yeah, it is a normal. And in fact, it, it has a very high income elasticity uh, because uh, uh, changes in income lead to a big increase in demand for that. If I were Starbucks, I'd want to locate my new stores where, there, where incomes are rising. In what country have incomes been rising rapidly? China. China. Good. And so Starbucks already has like 284 outlets, and their plans are to put another 300 in this year. Either They're either in construction or they're on the books to be planned to, to be expanded. Good. And the reason is that, that as incomes rise in China, there's a big increased demand for Starbucks. When I first... When I first read that Starbucks was going to open coffee shops in China, I thought, that is really stupid. The Chinese don't drink coffee. They drink what? Tea. They drink tea, right? Well, let me just tell you this. If, if, if you form an opinion like that's really stupid and it's being done by Starbucks, it's probably not stupid, right? <laughs> they probably know what they're doing. It turns out that as incomes have risen, Buying things that are Western has become a change in taste and preference, has become more popular. And Starbucks in China operate like a restaurant. Uh, and that is you go in and there's a maitre d' and you're seated at a table and they bring you a menu and then they serve you the coffee and, and whatever else uh, uh, you want. Uh, so it's very, very popular uh, in that way. And um, 
one of my Chinese students said to me, that's true in some of the areas, but in Shanghai, it's a standard Starbucks because their time is valuable. So they come and you know, order the coffee and then, and then take, it, uh, take it out. Good. As incomes fell in the United States, particularly in the 2008 financial downturn, Starbucks closed a whole bunch of, of locations because they just lost a lot of sales in that way. Good. So, and, and, and so Starbucks studies all these demographics and, of every market to estimate how strongly is the income elasticity. If incomes are dropping, do people buy less coffee? Good. They buy what? They buy cheaper coffee. Good. And so Ralph's coffee is an inferior good, right? It means that when incomes go down, there's an increased demand for Ralph's, increased demand for Maxwell House, uh, you know, the standard brands. Good. Good. Cross price elasticity means I'm measuring the effect of my quantity sales in response to a change in price of some other good, some, some other good. Notice cross price elasticity. Percentage change in quantity of X sold in response to percentage change in the price of some, uh, of some other good. I mentioned uh, um, pizzas are, are very, very similar products. If Domino's, if Domino's lowers their price, what will happen to the sales of Little Caesars? go down. Good. So for substitutes, it's a negative relationship, right? I'd get a negative number. For complements, it's a positive relationship. As, as the price of, of, of baseball bats go up, no, no, I got it backward. Yeah, good. I was just testing you. I actually knew. <laughs> for substitutes, it's, a, it's an inverse relation. No, for substitutes, it's a positive relationship. For complements, it's an inverse relationship. There it is. Good. So these calculations are made, uh, and, and, and we're studying marketing, and, and this is a major characteristic. When I get into talking about the, the specifics of marketing, I'll talk a lot more about elasticity of the target market and so forth. But firms invest a lot of money through consulting firms of estimating what is the elasticity of demand for various products. And that's what you're going to be doing when you do your pricing uh, uh, research uh, research report. Um, how strong the magnitude is of cross-price elasticity tells me how similar the other good is to my good uh, when you're doing substitutes. If there's a high response of my sales when this other company changes their price, then they must be close substitutes. Uh, and that's, again, that's a way of identifying these kinds of things. Ralph's does Vaughn's have a membership card? Yeah. yeah. These guys have membership cards, and, they're, and it's a big difference in price. You all know that, right? It's a big difference in price. Like, like Chilean sea bass is, is like $23, but with the Ralph's card, it's like $11. I mean, there's these big differences in price. The major benefit of that is, it's partly price discrimination, but the major benefit is they sell all this data to uh, to the manufacturers, uh, and so manu so I can I can study everything you've bought, and I can see how your purchases change when relative prices change. You all with me? Good, uh, and and that can tell me a lot about how close they are as substitutes or as complements. Uh, Smucker's makes jelly. Uh, oh, no, no, it's not the one I wanted. Pepsi Cola. Right, Pepsi Cola bought. Frito Lay. And the reason is that they, they figured out that of all these chips, there was a strong relationship a, a, in complementary terms between uh, drinking Pepsi and, and, and buying Frito Lay. So if you own the two complements, then you can, you can potentially raise overall revenue depending on where the margins are. I can lower the price on Fritos. That's going to increase the demand for, uh, for Pepsis. Finally, courts use cross-price elasticity as a measure of market power of the firm, of market power of the firm. If there's a high cross-price elasticity, it means you don't have much market power. 
because people are, are, are willing to switch really easily between uh, products. If it's a very low cross-price elasticity, then that means you have more market power. Uh, and, and, and there are, in the antitrust laws, differences in, in restrictions on your behavior based on the percentage of the market that you, in fact, uh, that you have. Good. Now, this topic is called Transactions Cost of Exchange. Uh, and it's not in the textbook. Not in, it's it's in a few textbooks, but but it's 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 my stuff. So you definitely want to know this. It's real simple, but you definitely want to understand this. When exchanges take place, there are costs of making the exchange take place. Y'all with me? There are costs of actually having the the, the purchase uh, take place or the sale uh, take place. If you're in a new area and you don't know where things are. Uh, how would you find stuff? You, you just moved to Northridge. You're, you're from out of state. Just moved to Northridge. How would you figure out where Starbucks are and these things? Yelp Internet. Good. Yelp Internet. Uh, uh, and in fact, you can just put in, in, in those mapping programs, you can put in coffee and it shows you where they are and so forth. Good. Also, the Yellow Pages used to be a, a, a real source of information. Uh, but the main thing is that you just drive around, right? You just drive around to, to look at where stuff is, right? And you know Vaughn sells groceries, and there's this big red neon sign that says Vaughn's. Good. Well, that signage is costly for the firm, but they're doing it to lower your search cost, to make it easier for you to find them. Y'all with me? Good. If that is true, then... Where I see large turnovers of population, I would tend to see more advertising. And the standard example of this is Las Vegas, right? You all have seen, or you've been there, but you've seen just amazing uh, uh, signage and advertising, and the cowboy and is all lit up and, and so forth. So, so advertising is, is, is expensive, signage is expensive, but in fact, it's done to lower the cost of, of search. Thousand Oaks is a bedroom community uh, that was built, I don't know when, 50s or something. And I was driving up to Santa Barbara several years ago, and I, I was out of film, which tells you it was several years ago. And so I pulled off the freeway into this, I'd never been in Thousand Oaks, and I pulled off the freeway to get film, and, and, I, and I got to a little shopping area, and, and there's no signs. There's no signs. Like, like in the valley... Every, every, every corner that has like six stores has that big, you know, tower of advertising of what is there. No signs. And then I looked more closely and they have wooden signs outside the store itself that's three by five. And, and they're allowed to put a light on it uh, at night. Now, this has changed somewhat since then. But the reason was when they built Thousand Oaks, they said this is a bedroom community, right? And so we don't want it to be highly commercialized. We don't want all that commercial signage and stuff. So, and, and our people are going to find out where stuff is, and then they'll know when they live here. Uh, and we're not, con we're not concerned about other people. So, so it was really costly. It was a great lesson to me. It was really costly to find out where I could get film because of the restriction on, uh, on, on signage. The second part of information cost is the cost to you of identifying the quality of what it is that you're considering buying. It's called quality identification cost. Grocery stores have all the produce out and available to you. Uh, and it's costly for them to do because some of it goes bad and so forth. But they do it because you want to, t to hold on to the avocado, right? You want to thump the watermelon. You want to smell the cantaloupe. Uh, you want to examine the characteristics of the product in estimating how much, how much value you would get uh, uh, out of it. Uh, uh, and, so, and so that's one of the reasons for stores carrying inventory, uh, et cetera. It used to be the case that electronics, like TV sets and stereo systems, were sold... And, and they still are, like Best Buy and, and these big, you know, big locations that carry them. But because the quality identification cost was very high, the salespeople were trained by the manufacturers to, to understand how the products work. 
You with me? And so they would ask you, like, like they do on computers, how are you going to use it? And then they would recommend various you know, combinations of, of quality. What's happened now with the internet is that it's very easy, as you know, to go on websites like CNET, which is a website that has reviews of all the electronic stuff, uh, and it's an independent uh, website, and gather information there about the quality of these particular uh, products. Amazon has that fantastic star system, right, where you can immediately go in and, and you know, there's a thousand purchases and you can see the distribution of five star versus one star. <laughs> I have this Tiffany lamp that has a beautiful, it's just a little desk, desk lamp, but it has a Tiffany uh, a glass cone, right, on it. And, uh, and I was looking to buy one, and, and it was on Amazon, and, and this guy had his review, and it turns out there's a series of holes in the top to allow the heat to, to escape. And then there are two holes that are somewhat smaller, and that's where you insert the screws to hold it in place. So this guy was complaining that every, he, he bought the lamp, and the shade kept falling off. The shade kept falling off. He, so he sent it back and he got another one. He said that one was defective too. What well, was clear to me what happened is he was trying to put the screw into one of the air holes, right? And, and of course it fell off, right? So anyway, one of my favorite stories. And then obviously, like, like on a car, you would really examine a lot of information before buying the car. And again, now... I always buy used cars. Buy a car that's two years old with low mileage, single owner. And I can get all that on Carfax. I can get the whole history of the car, how long it's been on the road. And I saved like $8,000 on the Maxima that I bought uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's really the way to do it. And, 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 and also now you can, you can find out how much the dealer paid for the car. Uh, and then you do an internet purchase and you say, I'll give you $200 over what you paid. You don't have to even pay a salesperson, right? Just deal with the, with the company. Good. Second category is the cost of coming to an agreement between the two parties of what, in fact, will be exchanged uh, and, 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 and at what rate, meaning the price that you're going to pay uh, for the good. Uh, many, many things are negotiable. Many, many things are negotiable. Furniture is very negotiable. Mattresses are very, very negotiable. You all with me? Because there's big markup on these retail locations. Uh, and I went in and bought, what I did is I bought a mismatch of the box springs don't match the pattern of the, of the mattress, right? But I got a big discount because I was willing to do it. Um, when I was... When I was consulting, I had a really, I, I had a really nice briefcase, and I wanted two things. I wanted a single center latch instead of those two silly things that bend down, and I wanted it to be expandable. And I went into one of these luggage stores, and they had some really nice ones, and uh, and there were two of them, and one of them was on sale, and then the other one was the one I wanted. Uh, and so I simply said to, and I was talking to the clerk about the quality and the manufacturing and so forth. I said, you know, I really, I really. I really like this one, but this one's on sale. Could, is there something you could do for me on this? That's all I said. Y'all with me? I just said, is there something you can do for me in this? He said, let me check. He went back in the back, came back and said, yeah, the, the owner said I can give you 15% off. It was that easy. You guys with me? So negotiate, negotiate. Uh, uh, it really pays off. Obviously, in business transactions, negotiating costs can be extremely high, as you know, because you hire attorneys to write the contracts between the two parties. And the contract may be very complex because you want to specify what each person's responsibility is given all kinds of things that might change, right? Like an act of God or a flood or whatever the case may be. So negotiating costs can be very high for some kinds of uh, uh, transactions. And if you can find a way of lowering that, then that can increase your uh, sales. Every store now has what icons right next to the door? Well, it could be handicap, but what else? Can you 
could be that. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are great. Wi-Fi? Yeah. No, every store has like five of these right next to each other. Yeah, credit cards they accept. Good. And they're doing that, again, to lower your information cost, uh, lower your negotiating cost. They're saying ahead of time, I will accept these means of payment. Uh, uh, and so that's an example of of how you can undertake an activity that will lower these various kinds of costs and generate a bigger uh, demand. Finally, the simple one is transportation costs, the cost of actually moving the goods between the two parties. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and in fact, in fact, think about it now, when you check out, they're making it easier and easier for you to, to pay. Right, uh, I mean, what you're giving them is dollars, but now you can do it with your phone, right? You can scan it, right? And then the chip was a big change in the in the uh, in the credit cards. Good. So those are examples of lowering transportation costs. My daughter lived in Indonesia for three years studying Eastern religions, and um, we set up a little bus a little import business uh, into the United States, and they make these carved masks, which are just magnificent, and the details are amazing. And I, we could get them for like, like 75 cents a piece, right? And then we could sell them for like $9, $10, and the other ones, $12 and $15. So it was really a good opportunity. And they also had these, these, these um, CD racks that were a, a, like a little man, and they were out of ebony wood, and it's like a soldier, right? And then down the center was where you put the, the CDs into it. They had a small one and then they had a large one. So I ordered like five of the, of the tall ones. And, um, and then everything, you know, was shipped over, and I went down to the docks to, to get it. Well, it turns out that when you ship stuff, it's not the weight that matters. It's not, I thought it would be the weight, right? No, it's the size. Because think about it. It's, it's how much of the ship is your item taking up? How much space is it taking up? So I bought these things for like $4, and then the shipping expense was like $18 a piece. So in some cases, transportation costs can be a large portion of, uh, uh, of the actual exchange. So, so those are transactions costs. And as I said, and, and we'll do more of this when we do the, the marketing stuff specifically, but if you can find ways of lowering these kinds of costs, then, in fact, you can increase sales. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like a, it's, it's a really great understanding of something that is not often talked about, but, in fact, can be very uh, effective. And that completes our discussion of price uh, elasticity. Good.